want to uh, reflect on this story that happened on October 25th, 1854. It was during the Crimean War, and there was a group of about 400 British soldiers that were making their stand against 2,500 Russian cavalry. 400 against 2,500. The officer in charge of the British soldiers was named Colin Campbell, and he told his men, he said, there is no retreat from here, men. You must die where you stand. And so what he did was he spread his forces two men deep into what is now referred to as the thin red line. Because back then, it was traditional, it was procedure that it was at least four men deep. By spreading them two men deep, he could go a little bit wider, but with just 400 men against 2,500, the odds were not in their favor. They fired off a couple volleys to the Russian army, and surprisingly, what ended up happening was the Russian army turned and left the battle. Altogether, It's an incredible underdog story of 400 going up against 2,500. But I I want to reflect on that phrase, you must die where you stand. Because maybe you've heard that phrase mentioned in different television shows or movies. It's always, you know, so dramatic. Maybe a call to courage or a warning that is uh, placed. And yet... What does it mean to live where you stand? I mean, comparing the two, it's like, okay, I I think I'd rather live where I stand. Dying where you stand sounds really dramatic. And living where you stand, it might just sound like the, the normal routines of life. You know, hanging out with family and friends, going out to eat, getting Starbucks, living where you stand, we, we, we can handle that. But what does it really mean to live where we stand as a follower of Jesus. Where does the follower of Jesus stand? Because when we're referring to that, we're referring to what is the ultimate reality? What is the position that each follower of Jesus is really in? And that position is something that we may not think of regularly in the day-to-day. We are faced with the regular norms and the frustrations of life that can distract us from what we have in Jesus. And this morning, what I want to do is I want to give us a similar charge as Colin Campbell. And what I want to say to us this morning is there is no retreat from here, follower follower of Christ, You must live where you stand. And this morning, we are going to be just parking in Romans chapter 5, the first 11 verses. So I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to follow along or turn on your Bible uh, to that that part of Scripture, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And before we jump in this morning, will you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity that we have to gather and and to worship and to fellowship and to hear from you. And we pray, God, that as we open up your word this morning, help us to understand maybe those things that we have maybe read many times before, maybe that we have taken for granted. God, I, I pray that you would impress upon our hearts in a new way. Help us to be attentive, God, in our ears, in our hearts, and help us to apply what your word is saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Romans chapter five says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. 
While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So this morning, I want us to look at what is necessary in order to understand, in order to understand where we stand before God, where it is we stand. If we are to live where we stand, where do we actually stand? And three statements that we're going to make about that this morning. The first one, the basis of right standing with God is Jesus. The basis of right standing with God is Jesus. The biggest question for anyone who has seriously contemplated the state of their soul is this. How can I be right with God? How can I be made right with God? People answer that question with various responses that often point to what they have done. Well, I've gone to church I've done a lot of good things. I helped in the children's ministry. I was baptized as a baby. I served. I grew up in a Christian family. Many will point to the fact that they're not really all that bad uh, of a person, that really they're pretty good. But regardless of what we've done, regardless of the good things that we think we've done, regardless of what we try to identify ourselves as, as being a good person, our position before God is not changed because of our own works. And this is so important for anyone that is listening to this message to understand that it's not by adding religion to our life that we are made right before God, that we are acceptable before him. That life is not some kind of America's Got Talent show where you do your act before God, you live your life, and you're hoping that if you just did well enough, that God is going to hit the golden buzzer and you're going to go to the final round. But many people live their life like that, just if I can just please God. And yet the Bible tells us that we all fall short of God's standard that all of us fall short of God's requirements, that it's not going to be through our own efforts that we're made right with God. And that is such a critical truth for each of us to realize. However, it's in realizing that we are spiritually helpless that it's the first step in having a firm foundation. So if you're here this morning and you're saying, man, I feel hopeless and helpless, and maybe you just came in this morning for some hope, there's good news for you, is that the first step in having a firm foundation is realizing there's nothing in yourself that you can do. There's nothing that you just add to your life to be made right with God. But what we see here in Romans chapter 5 is so life-giving, so hopeful. Check out verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified, that is a term that literally means declared right, set free. It's a legal term, okay? So since we have been justified through faith, that is faith in Jesus, not just Faith for faith's sake, not just faith in something, not just being a person of faith. It's faith specifically in what Jesus has accomplished for us. We have peace with God. No conflict. Nothing in between. Nothing in the way. Nothing warring against God. That there is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ in whom we have gained access by faith into this grace. God's grace being his kindness toward us, his unmerited favor, something that was not deserved, not earned, nothing worked for, simply God just giving a gift to us in which we now stand. So the question, if we are to live where we stand, where does a follower of Christ stand? We stand in grace. 
We stand before God on the merits of what Jesus has accomplished. There is peace with God through Christ. Meaning, regardless of what you have done, regardless of how grievous the sin Whether you think it was minor, whether it was major, whether it had major impact on your life, broken relationships, broken family, lost job, whatever it was, no matter how grievous the sin, that there is forgiveness in Jesus. There is peace with God through Christ. It's not that you are innocent. It's not that your sin is not a big deal. It's not that it's swept under the carpet, but it's that if you've placed your trust in Jesus, you are acquitted. The price has been paid. The price has been paid in full. You do not have to face God's courtroom. However, through Christ, we not only receive his mercy, meaning we don't receive what we deserve, which is judgment, The fact is, we each deserve God's judgment, but in his mercy, we don't get that. But in his grace, we get what we don't deserve. We get him. Picture it like this. Picture that you're driving down the highway, and all of a sudden, you see those lights in your rearview mirror, and you know you are busted. I mean, you're not, it wasn't just like five miles per hour over the speed limit busted. We're talking like you've been going at least 25, and there is no hiding the fact like, oh, I thought it was 55. I thought it was 65. No, you were like 25 miles over the speed limit, and you know you are guilty. You know you are guilty. There is no hiding it. And the officer comes up, and you're talking with him, and you're expecting the ticket. And the officer says, I'm not going to write you a ticket. Like, wow, that is mercy. I deserve the penalty. I deserve the ticket. But the officer doesn't give you what you deserve. He shows mercy to you. But then he looks at your car and he says, your car needs some help. That thing's a piece of junk. I want you to follow me. I want to take you to the local car lot. I'm going to get you a new car. Imagine that. You're like, that doesn't happen. That kind of thing doesn't happen. Not only the mercy, I didn't get the ticket, but also, holy cow, you provided me an entirely new vehicle that I don't deserve. That is grace. But yet that illustration pales in comparison to what God has done for us. Not only that we didn't get what we deserve in our sin, but that Jesus paid the penalty and then he gives us eternal life with him, that we are declared right in his sight, that we have peace with him, that we can stand before him and be with him forever. That's incredible. See, some of us, though, would get more excited right now about a car. Man, I need a new car. Ten years down the road, you're going to need another new car. What God has done for you is for all of eternity. But sometimes we don't celebrate that in the same way. It's like, well, cars are really cool. This is your soul we're talking about. The fact that God loves you so much that his righteous wrath toward our sin has been pacified because of the sacrifice of Jesus who willingly paid that price in full on our behalf. That Jesus opens up the floodgates of grace for us. Now think about that, because sometimes we just think like, oh yeah, grace, I received that. Like it was this one-time deal, like your driver's license. Like, oh yeah, I got that. But no, it's just continual grace. It's just continually poured out grace on our behalf. That grace is just continually, continually poured out upon us. And how many of us need grace? How many of us, like every day, need grace? Man, this last week, I desperately needed grace. And it's not like, oh, some days I need more grace than others. Man, every day I'm a hopeless mess without Jesus. That every day we desperately need grace. It's not like, oh, God's up there saying, oh, they just needed 10% today. They're doing pretty good. No, every day we need to be overwhelmed with God's grace toward us. And every day God freely pours out his grace on our behalf, that it's not just some simple one-time gift that God has given, but continually receiving his grace. And receiving that grace, receiving that gift has nothing to do with your history or your potential. 
has nothing to do with the family you grew up in or how bad your life was in the past or how good you think it was in the past. And it's not about, okay, God's doing this for you now because one day you're just going to really do something great for him. God's not scratching your back because one day you're going to scratch his. It's because God is just so good. Forgiveness is not based on your worthiness. Forgiveness is not based on the level of offensiveness. Meaning that it's not like, well, God will forgive most of your sin, but the big ones, you got to kind of work off a little bit. You got to kind of ease God back into that because that's a, that one's a doozy. Every single sin, God forgives based on what Christ has done for us. Jesus forgives sin. There is no sin, again, there's no sin that is excused. There's no sin that is swept under the carpet. Every sin is laid bare before him. And that fact right there, every sin is laid bare before him, often will tend us to, to react one of two ways. Either shame, like, oh, man, I'm such a loser. I can't believe I did that. Oh, woe is me. Woe is me. Oh, my sin. Oh, it's so terrible. Oh, I hurt so many people. Oh, I disappointed so many people. I'm just a loser. Oh, woe is me. Oh, poor me. Oh, poor me. And that shame, and we're just consumed by our shame. Or we start doing this. Well, you know what? If you didn't raise me this way, if you were a better example, if only you would have done this, if you would have shown me what it meant to be a man, if you would have shown me what it was to be a woman, whatever it was, and we, pl- we blame other people for the choices we make. See, what God desires to do is, man, expose the sin so that we can be forgiven of the sin because he took care of the sin in Jesus that covers the shame, that gives no reason just to point blame because we are responsible for our own sin. Sin had us as a dead man walking. And that's no exaggeration. Look at what he says in verse 6. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, we were powerless. You know, sometimes people have a really hard time accepting God's grace because it's like, I just don't deserve it. That's what grace is. None of us deserve God's grace. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. It'd be something you earned. Sometimes people think, well, everyone else here just has it all together. I mean, I see their Facebook posts and marriages are happy and the kids get along and it seems like they like their jobs and their dog even looks nice. And it's like, man, I'm the only one. Look around you. Look around you this morning. There is not one person in this room that doesn't desperately need God's grace. All of us desperately need God's grace. And the good news is that that's exactly what God desires to give to us. God's not stingy with grace. God's not holding out on us. Romans says that while we are yet powerless, meaning there was nothing that we could do in ourselves. There was nothing that we were trying to do. There was nothing that we could do to earn it. We were powerless. Absolutely nothing that we are offering to God. We were hopeless. And if you're here this morning and you're feeling hopeless, on one hand, that's good. Because you realize the answer is not found in you. But we don't want to just leave it there. It's good because when you realize you're powerless, you have to turn to who really is powerful to help the powerless, and that is Jesus, that Jesus brings hope to the hopeless. How? Because when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He came to save sinners, people like me, people like you. There may be varying degrees of what we've done, but we all fall desperately short all the same. Jesus came for people that didn't have it all together, people that weren't deserving, people that were headed for an eternity apart from God. And you want to know who appreciates grace? Those that realize how desperately they need it. See, people that thought their life was pretty much all together already, and then, oh, Jesus just offered heaven as well, and eternal life, well, great, I'll take that one too. (laughs) And just add that one to the mix because, hey, I got it all together. Life's not bad. Life is good. 
It's those that realize in our sin, we fall desperately short and God meets us there. And he saves us and he gives us a new identity and an eternal hope. It's those people that realize what God has done in his grace that truly appreciate that grace, that it's undeserved, unmerited, and freely poured out for us in Christ. Verse eight, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So through Jesus, we receive justification. We receive forgiveness. That Jesus is the embodiment of God's love. We're saved from God's wrath, according to verse 9. This is so much larger than just adding religion to your life and just being a person of faith and just going to church and just trying to do good things. It's that God has radically rescued you. That where you stand now is not where you once were. And there might be only one day that separated you from the person you were before you knew Christ and the person you are now. One day difference, but an eternity impact. Because where you stood the day without Christ to the next day now with him is totally radically different. It might say, well, it's only one day. No, your standing is forever altered because you've been justified because of Jesus And that leads us to the next statement, suffering does not hinder this hope. And that's so important for us to realize because oftentimes in life we compartmentalize life. You know, there's the good days that we have, the good things that happen where you're having a great time with family and friends, the job's going well, and and, and life is just good. There's answered prayer, and it just seems like, yeah, that's good. And then there's those times where it's hard. What we would compartmentalize is bad days, bad times in life where there's struggle, where there's pain, where there's loss and death. And we praise God when things are good and things are happening how we'd like them to. But then there's those difficult in-betweens where it just seems like we're waiting for good to happen. Come on, God, I want to I have a reason to praise you. Come on, God. And we're afraid to even ask what else could go wrong because we're sure with how things are going, if we ask that question, oh, we'll find out. Shouldn't have asked that question because the rabbit hole always goes deeper. And in these moments, we tend to base where it is that we're standing on what we're currently experiencing. Where do we stand? Well, man, we're standing on shaky ground because look at my life. Look at these circumstances that I'm going through, but that is not where you stand. Where you stand is not based on your experiences. It's not based on what you are suffering. Instead, how we view our suffering, we have to view it through the lens of grace, not the exception to grace. It's not that you receive God's grace here and then you have the good days, but then, man, the bad days, you're not under grace that it's just rough, that it's just really hard. But look at what he says in verse three. We also glory in our sufferings. Now he's not saying, hey, we celebrate the hard times. Yeah, I got my heart broken. Yeah. Lost my job, always wanted that to happen. He's not saying we rejoice for the hard times. We rejoice in our sufferings because there is grief and loss. There is pain and trials. There are tears and agony, but the suffering is not the end result. The suffering is not the ends. It does not cast the shadow or overpower the grace we have received. In fact, the result of suffering is that when we handle it correctly, it heightens our sensitivity and our appreciation of the hope that we have in Christ, that suffering can expose the value of what we have in Jesus all the more. And so therefore, suffering is not just a cog. It's not a cog in the machine. It's not the exception to the rule. It can be the very means that God uses to produce in us a greater appreciation for him and his grace and helping us become more like Jesus, Romans Five Verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, suffering for us, while not appreciated or not enjoyable, 
is not the unbridled enemy of the follower of Jesus. Rather, it's the means of producing good within us. It's the furnace that burns away the dross. It's the chisel that's working at us, shaping us to be more like Jesus and to understand what it is that he has truly accomplished for us. So hope in the midst of suffering is not just hope that we won't have to suffer or just that we'll get out of it, but that the ultimate hope is that we will be in the presence of God. See, there is always a great risk to hope. Because those things that you hope in, it's like, well, what about, what if I'm disappointed? What if that doesn't happen? I mean, we talk about, hey, the Packers are looking pretty good this year, but none of us are celebrating that they've already won the Super Bowl. Because right now, it's just a hope. But the hope that we have in what Christ has done is already a done deal. That the suffering cannot take away from it. It's like, oh, man, shoot, that blew it. Jesus has already secured for us the victory. It's a certain reality. And each one of us have had situations in life where we hope for something to happen and that particular outcome did not occur. Sometimes we look at our suffering and we're like, man, does God really love me? Because if he loved me, why didn't he answer this prayer the way I wanted to? Or why am I going through this situation? Why am I suffering the way that I'm suffering? Why am I going through this? God loves you immensely. He loves you so much. He gave his son for you. And look at the reason for the hope that he would continue to shape you and to direct you to that hope in him, that hope that does not put us to shame. What we see here, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. But the suffering is hard. But yet there's hope that overcomes even then. Hudson Taylor was a missionary in the 19th century that had a heart for the people of China. He had a heart to reach the people there, and he went through some incredible hardship. His wife died at the age of 33. He lost four of his eight kids to death in in his attempt to minister to the people of China. And this is what he said. He said, if God should place me in serious perplexity... Must he not give me much guidance? In positions of great difficulty, much grace. In circumstances of great pressure and trials, much strength. No fear that his resources will prove unequal to the emergency. And his resources are mine, for he is mine and is with me and dwells in me. See, the hope that he had in the midst of even great suffering, God is with me. It's a peace that we have because of Christ, that we've been justified, that we have peace with him, that we will be with him, that changes the way in how we live our lives and where we see that we're standing, that even hard times cannot impact what Christ has accomplished for us. And that leaves us to our last statement. There is reason to boast. There's reason to boast in where we stand after proclaiming that we have been justified through faith, that we have peace with God through Jesus, that we have received and stand in grace, the author says in verse 2, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Such a hope, not only that we have been made right with God, but that we will also be with him in his presence and his glory. See, all other hopes... All of their boasts pale in comparison to what we have in Jesus. I mean, I'm still celebrating, hey, the Bucks won. After 50 years, I'm still waiting to get my championship gear. But another year from now, it's going to be a different story. I know there's going to be some, oh, wait, no, they're going to repeat. You know, we're going for two. Okay, but then there's going to be a new champ, and it's going to be all celebrated after that. Those victories are only so long, but Jesus' victory is eternal. And what we have to boast about, we think, oh, we're not supposed to boast. No, we're not supposed to boast about us. We're not supposed to boast about us. We're not supposed to make a big deal about us because we're not all that, but God is all that. We are supposed to boast about God. We are supposed to brag on our God. The fact that any single person that lives 
can be forgiven of all of their sin, can be rescued from their hopelessness and their helplessness because there's a God who loves, there's a God who forgives, there's a God who pours out his grace, there's a God who offers eternal life with him, peace with him, and eternity with him, joy with him, unbridled satisfaction with him. This is a God worth boasting about, worth bragging about, worth celebrating, worth worshiping. And when we realize where we stand because of him, it's like, man, he gets all the glory more and more, more and more, God. And that's where he is at here. We boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 11, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's interesting because that word that he used twice in boast, boasting in God, that word boast is the same word that he uses for glory in our suffering. That we can make much, that we can boast even in the midst of our suffering because of who our God is. So believer, this morning, I want to encourage you with where you stand. In order to live where you stand, you have to know where you stand. The reality is you are saved That Jesus has the victory and all who put their trust in him have this victory as well. That there is reason to celebrate right now regardless of what is happening in your life. If life is the hardest it's ever been and you are a follower of Jesus, as as heavy as your heart may be right now, there is still reason to boast And there is reason to celebrate. There is reason to glory. There is reason to sing. There is reason to live life differently. There is hope. Our God has overcome. And everyone who puts their trust in Christ has been reconciled to God. The relationship is no longer broken. Your future is secure. You stand in grace. That's where you stand. You stand in Christ That's where you stand. This changes how you view your past. It changes how you view your present, what you're living for. It changes how you view your future. And so live with a hope. Live with the hope of where you stand and continually be a bigger bragger about who your God is because he is glorious you pray with me? Father, we praise you this morning for the hope that we have because of Christ. God, there is not one person in this room that is deserving of what you have done. All of us have blown it. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. And yet, God, out of your fabulous, immense love for us, you sent your son to die for us so that we would not have to face your judgment, but God, that we could be forgiven of all of our sin and not only forgiven, but to be adopted as your kids and to be with you forever in joy. And one day, God, you will wipe every tear from our eyes and the frustrations and the challenges of this life will be no more. But God, until then, help us to live faithful. Help us to live for your purpose, for your glory. And God, we pray that you'd be honored in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.